Hello, today is the 26th day of Tishrei, the 28th of October. And in these classes, we look at the articles that appear in this week's Wonders magazine, which you can usually download on Monday night from our Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash galenai, G-A-L-E-I-N-A-I. This year we're focusing on different models and corresponding them to models in Kabbalah and other areas of the Torah. And if you don't know what that is and what a partzuf is and what a model is and all that, I recommend looking at the uh, videos that I shared uh, from the beginning of this year, 5785. Uh, they're on my channel as well. But let's get into it because we have a number of different uh, models to cover this week. Uh, the first one is the colors of the rainbow. Now, the rainbow is obviously very much related to this week's Parsha, Parsha Noah, or Noach in Hebrew. Noach is the hero of the Parsha. He's the righteous individual whom God selects to basically save life on earth uh, before the flood comes. And the flood is a punishment, and it's a punishment for the... Uh, impossible, impossibly evil behavior of mankind during the first ten generations. Noah is the tenth generation from Adam. And Noah builds his famous ark and the uh, representatives of different types of uh, life come and are harbored there for a whole year until the flood uh, ends. And actually the flood began and ended in this month of Cheshvan that we're going to start on uh, Friday, or rather on, on Saturday and Shabbat. One of the things we know about uh, the flood was that during the flood, there was, no, uh, there was no sky that could be seen. The sky was basically covered by clouds. Uh, what these clouds were exactly and wh where they came from, there's all kinds of theories about this. But the general idea is that there was some type of um, shift in the earth, and there was some kind of shift in the in the uh, in the weather, and there was an incredible amount of rain, and um, there's a whole redistribution of water on earth, much of the water coming up from the uh, from the abyss below the earth, and a lot of it apparently coming down from the from space. Um, one of the most interesting theories I've heard about this, the sages uh, say in the tractate of Brachot at the end, that the way that God brought the flood, meaning the uh, God can make a flood without this, but the natural means by with which this happened was <coughs> that a what the sages call a star hit the earth. And the way we would understand this is uh, uh, an asteroid hit the Earth. Where did this asteroid come from? There's a good reason to uh, believe that this is from the Oort Belt asteroids. And uh, if you know a little bit about the uh, structure of the solar system, <coughs> there's basically three belts of asteroids in our solar system. There's the famous one that's around uh, between Mars and Jupiter. That's the close, closest one. Um, then we have the uh, Keeper Belt asteroids, which are just uh, beyond Neptune. Uh, today we know that, or at least we consider Pluto, which used to be a planet, to be a Keeper Belt object. And finally we have the Earth Belt, which is further out and covers pretty much the extent of the space between our solar system and the, and the, next, uh, and the next star um, over. Uh, Alpha Centauri. So many of these, I, I said before it was an Earth Belt object, but I, I misspoke. It was a Keeper Belt object. Many of the Keeper Belt objects are ice. They're basically frozen water. Some of them are frozen methane, but most of them are frozen water from what we know. Um, I believe that Pluto is like that. And if any of these are knocked out of their very huge orbit around the sun, and they come into the center of the solar system, they stand a good chance of hitting something. 
So the idea that the sages say, which is really remarkable, where, because you can't see any of these objects with the naked eye, so where did they even know that there were these belts of asteroids? Where did they get this from? This is a, in and of itself a mystery. And the idea that to know that some of these are, objects are made out of water, to be, be it frozen, but when you get into the central solar system, it thaws and becomes, especially when it would hit the Earth, it would become a tremendous amount of water. So that is also uh, pretty amazing. I heard this uh, analysis from a friend of my, uh, Zivi Ritchie, who's a brilliant thinker, and um, he came up with this an, uh, understanding of what the Talmud was saying at, at, in tracted of Brachot. But let's get to our topic, that after the flood, God makes a covenant with Noah and with mankind. And we've covered this topic in the past because it's so, it's so incredible. It's one of these really incredible uh, parts of the Torah, and it's universal, and uh, everybody really should study this Parsha deeply, the first two Parshas, which two first two Torah portions, Bereshus and Noah, that they are the universal uh, Parshot that deal with all of humanity. And the aftermath is that God makes a covenant, and He says He won't destroy the world again <coughs> with water. And the covenant has a sign, just as the covenant of circumcision has a sign. Uh, the covenant with humanity has a sign, and the covenant sign is the rainbow. Now, the rainbow has become, because of that, a symbol of peace, a symbol of, um, of God's uh, willing to, willingness to tolerate uh, even evil states that might mimic what there was before the flood, in a sense saying, I'm not going to give up on the world anymore. If it takes you a billion years to figure it out, that's how long it's going to take. I won't reset reality. Um, this, is, this is a very important uh, concept that the Torah is telling us, is that don't expect God to somehow figure it out for us. Uh, we have to work hard to figure out how we want to live together, how we want to create harmony between people, and how we want to serve God. The amazing thing is that in the verses that describe this covenant, which is in chapter 9 of Genesis, um, the word covenant appears seven times. And we've discussed this in past years. Seven times, and there's two things that come with this covenant. The first one is the rainbow as its sign. And I don't know where this came from. Newton is the one who describes it the most, but I don't think he was the first, that the rainbow is seen as composed of seven colors. I, obviously, the rainbow is many more colors. There's a source in the sages that says that the rainbow has 378 colors. But the way that this was uh, understood colloquially and uh, over centuries and millennia was that when people looked at the rainbow, they saw seven colors. So these seven colors clearly correspond to the seven times that the word covenant appears in these verses describing the covenant that God made with Noah and with his descendants. They also, these seven instances of covenant, also correspond to the seven Noahide laws, which we'll look at during the rest of the week. Um, but first of all, these seven colors. Now, how would we choose a model? It's not very difficult. But before we choose a model to take these seven colors and correspond them to, and this, by the way, gives tremendous insight. There's a lot of people who do color therapy, who do um, interior design, who plan events, and they need a color scheme. So knowing the relationship between color and, and the model that we're going to present in a moment is crucial. It's really one of those things that should be studied in every art school. Um, so before we look at what we're going to correspond the seven colors of the rainbow to, we need to know that the Zohar, which is the basic medrash, the basic uh, rabbinic text, uh, which is the basis of the Torah's mystical dimension, it actually says that the rainbow is composed only of three colors. Now the colors that they, they choose in the Zohar are very surprising. They are a white, red, and yellow. 
or green. The word for a yellow and green in Hebrew um, can be both. Uh, the word is yerok, but it can mean yellow sometimes, and sometimes it means uh, green, like, like the way it is in modern Hebrew. Um, so the, the Zohar has this strange take. It says there's actually three colors. Now, when we have a discrepancy that is so powerful, and, and you also have to ask, how is white a color? Uh, white uh, is not considered a color. White is like the uh, reflection of all the colors together. So there's a way to, to build it, but you can't find white as a color in nature. It doesn't exist in nature. So what exactly would it mean that there's this strange contradiction between the Zohar and, the, and, and nature, and let's call it science or um, sensory experience, that there are a number of colors, none of them are white, and red and yellow-green, well, they're in there, but and there's only two. And why only three when the entire world says there's seven? So the moment you have these, three, these two numbers, three and seven, so right away you say, wait a minute, this is... Uh, exactly how the sfirot, sfirot are structured. The Sfirot are the, uh, call it like the prism of God's light or God's revelation that take infinity and tone it down into something finite so we can grasp it in some way in, in, in our lives. So we call it sometimes channels of divine influence or effluence uh, because they allow the divine which is infinite to um, sustain our reality, which is finite. So the Sfirot are always divided into three and seven. That's the basic division. The three are the intellectual Sfirot, uh, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And the seven are what we call the emotional, habitual Sfirot. And they are loving kindness and might and beauty, uh, victory, acknowledgement, foundation, and kingdom. I'm using the English words. Obviously, they don't always capture the full meaning in Hebrew, but it's good enough to work with. So we have seven and three. And this is a beautiful way to take two sources. One is our experiential empirical source, what we know about nature. The, we, we tend to divide the rainbow into seven colors. And the Torah source, which talks about three colors in the Zohar, and to put them together. And then what we discover is that Obviously, the Zohar is talking about the intellectual sfirot. So the colors would be the white corresponds to wisdom, red corresponds to understanding. That's pretty much straightforward in any kind of Kabbalistic thinking. We may get into this as we go through the rest of the week to explain exactly why. And then yellow-green also fits beautifully with knowledge. Uh, these are very well-known correspondences. There is nothing very surprising about them. But what we learn from this is that the Zohar is not talking about our physical experience of the rainbow. Rather, it's talking about a contemplative experience of the rainbow. Meaning that when a person is contemplating the rainbow, these are the colors that appear in the mind. It's not the same thing as what the eye sees. What the mind experiences is sometimes different than what the eye, the physical senses, experience. So the mind has its own world. Comes the Zohar and says, when we contemplate the rainbow, we see wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, or white, red, and yellow, green. But the physical experience of the rainbow is the seven colors that we're all familiar with. So what are these colors? So the way, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say them in the way they are in the rainbow. We're going to leave that for the rest of the week because there's a whole issue about that, the order in which they appear in the rainbow. The rainbow is basically just light that's been uh, 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 scattered by, uh, by the clouds, by, by, uh, by water particles. So we get a spectrum of all the possible colors. And what we see is the blues on one side, the reds on the other side, and the yellow greens in the middle. So without getting into the correspondence right now, we're just going to build this, the first level of this. So the way it is is that blue is loving kindness, red is might, yellow is beauty, then we have violet in victory, orange in acknowledgement, 
and green in foundation, and indigo in kingdom. I'm going to say this also in Hebrew, in case you're familiar with the names of the Sfirot in Hebrew, because it will make much more sense. So blue is chesed, red is gvura, yellow is tiferet, violet is netzach, orange is hod, green is yesod, and indigo is malchus. So during the rest of the week, we're going to look at this, and we're going to also connect it to the seven Noahide laws, because we said they both come from the same place, in a certain sense, from the Torah's use of the word covenant seven times, when describing the agreement, the, uh, the, the, uh, the covenant that God made with Noah and his descendants after the flood. So thanks for joining today. I realize we, we haven't really gotten into the, nick, uh, into the uh, nitty-gritty of things, but hope you join us through the rest of the week, and I hope that we'll be, have time to look at all these different facets and how to use them, because really in the end, um, colors were meant to be used. Colors are meant to be experienced, are, but, but you have to understand the theory behind them. We're not going to get into all of color theory, that's way beyond our scope, but at least some of the basics so that we know how to use color the right way. Thanks for joining today. Hope to see you.